Good morning, and welcome to our auditorium. Uh, we have many guests and international travelers here, and we're particularly grateful to them for joining us. Um, joining me on stage is Francis Fukuyama, who is soon to succeed Larry Diamond as the director of the Center on Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law at Stanford University, our partner in this very important inquiry that we're launching here today on a topic that is, uh, one doesn't want to exaggerate, but I think it is in many ways the, the most important topic, certainly relating to governance and the way people rule their lives today in the world in which we live, not only here, but throughout. Um, we're going to engage this morning and tomorrow and this afternoon in a far-reaching inquiry into democracy, what it is, what it is today, how it is challenged from within, we're going to be discussing that in particular today, and from without, we'll be discussing that in a subsequent conference, why it matters, and how it might be reimagined and reinvigorated, which is going to be the subject of our final inquiry in June of this year, Making Democracy Work. As I said, I'm particularly grateful for the partnership of Stanford and the Center uh, in this project, and I'm very pleased with the fact that we have leading international scholars from across Europe and the United States here with us today to participate in this conference in our very own Frontiers of Democracy, which is, of course, Budapest, as well as this conference uh, in Hungary, and I think we'll reach into that aspect of the inquiry during the course of the conference as well. Um, this is part of a two-year initiative that CEU launched last year in response to the growing challenges to democracy that we can see all around us, certainly <coughs> here in Hungary, where Prime Minister Viktor Orban famously declared in July 2014 that he was a champion of illiberal democracy without particularly telling us what that meant. So that's, of course, part of our inquiry here. But he did cite as hints of what he had in mind the models of Russia, China, and Turkey. So we decided to use our geographic location, which seemed very favorable from the point of view of this inquiry, uh, to turn CEU into an international platform to study and project this far-reaching contest over the meaning and future of democracy. We're going to have four major conferences. First, today, what are the promises and problems of existing constitutional democracies? In December, we will have a conference on how is the challenge of protecting minorities addressed in the United States and Europe, with particular focus on African Americans and the Roma. In February, we will have a conference on what are the appeals and dangers of old and new models of illiberal governance, which is essentially governing in a way that is not particularly respectful of the principles of democracy, but is in fact part of a neo-authoritarian approach. And what are the experiments? The final one in June, as I said, will be what are the experiments and innovations that are being used to revi revitalize democracy in various places. So we think we're very well suited to this inquiry at CEU. We were founded in 1991. We're celebrating our 25th anniversary this year. So this is, in a sense, part of these celebrations. Um, we were founded to revive intellectual freedom in Central and Eastern Europe, which really the countries in which CEU operates were the, at that time, particularly in Central and Eastern Europe, were the only countries in the world to have been successively dominated by and devastated by the two great destructive ideologies of the 20th century, of course, fascism and communism. And uh, at the time, in 1991, there was a great optimism, I think, about the power and inevitability of democracy to 
overcome the legacy of totalitarianism. There was an optimism that was even stoked by the leaders of Central and Eastern Europe who were among the founders of CEU, along with George Soros, of course. Uh, the former dissident leaders who sought to lead their countries out of the totalitarian devastation, Václav Havel of Czechoslovakia, Bronislav Geremek of Poland, and Arpad Günch, who sadly died just this week uh, in Hungary. So this optimism, I think, and Frank, I think you'd agree with me about this, was also stimulated by public intellectuals and scholars of the time, and of course you famously <laughs> wrote about the optimism that we all felt, and, in, and we, I, we certainly felt it as you wrote it. Uh, but it was also reflected in the original mission of CEU, which was to teach and promote democracy and open societies, a natural and even inevitable outcome of the transition from totalitarianism. But we now know, I think, that there were two fundamental flaws in our optimism. There was nothing certain about transition. Transition didn't inevitably lead to democracy. And indeed, it wasn't particularly clear where it would lead as, it, as time went on. And there was nothing certain about democracy itself, that it could be challenged from many directions and indeed defined in many different ways. So today, 25 years later, we're in a very, very different geopolitical environment from when CEU was founded. We're, of course, in a multipolar world. There's been a reemergence of states jockeying for position. Uh, the earlier forces of integration, which seem to be promoting democracy as well as market economies and international trade and regional governance, like the rise of the EU, have been overcome in some respects by the forces of disintegration failed states, cultural and religious conflicts, terrorism, nationalism, xenophobia, all of the elements that we are very familiar with in our world today. As Ivan Krashtev, one of the um, people who is working very intensely on these conferences, wrote yesterday in the New York Times, we live in the age of disruption. So I think we see decay in constitutional democracies in the US and Europe, political polarization, which we'll discuss today in the conferences, in the conference, the capture of democratic institutions by economic lobbies and new oligarchies, growing inequality and disenfranchisement, which breeds discontent with democratic development. And then, of course, we see the rise of alternative models, neo-authoritarianism, created by the hollowing out of democracy, controlling of media, eliminating checks and balances, and creating circumstances where political elites can gain control and become predatory rulers, appealing to popular demand, which they manipulate by the control of the media for security and stability. So these are the great challenges that are faced by democracy today. But I think before we bury ourselves in pessimism, I think we should come back up for air and take a look around us and recognize that the um, demand for democracy, the manifested demand, not just the theoretical demand, but the actual demand that one can see from human activity around the world is perhaps greater than ever. It's a demand for gaining control over life, one's life, a demand for participating in decisions about the future, and a demand for human rights and freedoms. We certainly could see it in Tahrir Square in Cairo, in Taksim Park in Istanbul, in Maidan, the Maidan movement in Ukraine, in, Hong, in the Hong Kong democracy movement, and in the Black Lives Matter movement in the United States and many, many other popular mass movements for democratic change around the world. Now, we know that these movements recently have often been suppressed <laughs> or countermanded by competing demands from opposing movements. But I think the demand is still there. Indeed, it is very strong and growing, even as the supply of healthy democracy seems to be diminishing. So that's the conundrum that we're looking at in these conferences. And 
I think the demand for innovations and experiments in democratic governance uh, is something that we will examine at the end of this series in June of this coming year. Now let me just say a final word uh, about the refugee crisis, which is in many ways the most immediate manifestation of everything that we're talking about here. Um, this, is real, this is a real-time laboratory for all of the issues we're considering. It certainly reflects a huge demand by people who are fleeing war and devastation for control over their own lives and futures. And it reflects a struggle of European countries and the EU and the US, which has really been kind of missing in action in much of this up till now, to respond coherently to this demand, not only in terms of the dealing with the source of the crisis, which is of course in Syria and other countries that are in the midst of war, but also in dealing with the, the flight of the refugees themselves. And the real struggle, and I think I'll leave you with this, is the, there are two models at work in Europe today over how to address <coughs> the refugee crisis. Very different models. There is the illiberal nationalist model that appeals to xenophobia and excludes refugees. And it's probably most reflected right here in Hungary, certainly by the Hungarian government. And then there is the liberal regionalist model that recognizes the value of diversity and burden sharing in accepting and managing refugees across countries and nations. And I think in many respects, the future of democracy in Europe will depend on the outcome of the struggle between those two models. So let me just leave it at that and now say that it gives me great pleasure to turn the proceedings over to Francis Fukuyama, a very distinguished international scholar and public intellectual who has long been at the center of all of these inquiries, as I said earlier, inspiring us 25 years ago and again today in his most recent monumental book, Political Order and Political Decay from the Industrial Revolution to the Globalization of Democracy, in which, Frank, you really take us across the sweep of history in trying to understand how it is that decay comes about and what are the mechanisms and internal ways of trying to repair it. So let me turn to you. Thank you very much for, for being with us here today. Okay. Well, thank you very much, John. It's a great pleasure to uh, be here in Budapest uh, today. And uh, I'm speaking actually uh, in my formal role, I guess, because I am now, I have replaced Larry Diamond as the director of the Center on Democracy Development and the Rule of Law. Uh, so Larry has a break, and uh, I'm the one that gets to introduce our center and uh, our project. Uh, I should note, uh, in terms of my personal um, encounters with Hungary, the first time I visited this country, uh, was, I believe, in June of 1989. I was working in the State Department at the time for on the policy planning staff with uh, James Baker, who was the Secretary of State at that time. Uh, he was in the course of making a um, round-the-world trip. Uh, he stopped, uh, we stopped in Gdansk, Poland, uh, on our way to Budapest. Uh, this was right after the Polish Round Table. Uh, Secretary Baker met with Lech Wałęsa and all of the other folks from Solidarity. The transition in Poland had really uh, been much faster than anyone uh, anticipated. And then we came here, uh, where uh, a similar, I mean, you know, Poland and Hungary at that time were the two leaders in Eastern Europe and moving away from communism and uh, towards established liberal democracy. Uh, and I think that one of the reasons that I and other outside observers of recent events in Hungary have been so um, disappointed in the course of Hungarian politics uh, in the last few years is precisely for that reason, that Hungary was one of the first countries to make the transition. And the transition at that time seemed uh, amazingly unproblematic. I mean, obviously, you know, places like Romania, uh, and clearly elsewhere in the Balkans uh, had a much more rocky road. 
uh, after the fall of communism, but uh, we were all amazed at the time that uh, Hungary seemed to be ready to join the European Union, uh, met the accession criteria relatively rapidly, uh, and I thought, you know, uh, as little as, let's say, five years ago, that this was a completely unproblematic country. And the fact that uh, it's moved backwards, and I guess the, the disappointment is not just in poor performance of democratic institutions. I think the speech that Viktor Orban gave in Romania uh, last year, where he, in principle, said that they didn't want to be a liberal democracy, uh, was really quite a shock because it seemed you know, quite amazing that anybody who had actually joined the European Union and, in theory, had accepted the basic norms uh, of which you know, liberal tolerance is, was a foundation and human rights foundation for membership in the EU uh, could actually get up and make a speech uh, uh, contradicting those very principles. And I think it was also a disappointment to many of us outside observers that the rest of Europe took this you know, as calmly as they did uh, because uh, it seems to me that the EU is really not going to exist uh, without uh, common adherence to those uh, norms, and I think the uh, the migrant crisis that's hit uh, this region uh, in the last couple of months uh, is, you know, simply the latest uh, is the latest uh, example of um, the divergence of uh, of Hungary and other uh, countries in uh, Eastern Europe from. Uh, what had been uh, the earlier EU consensus. So I think it's very appropriate that we're meeting here. I'm really looking forward. I have not been in Hungary since, I believe, 2007 or 2008. So I'm really you know, eager to catch up and to speak uh, with more of you. Actually, can I have the water? Sure. <coughs> I've, <laughs> I've been traveling in Europe for the past week, and I've done a lot of speaking, and I'm, I'm my voice just has to hold out for the you know the next ten minutes or so. So, if you'll bear with me, so I wanted to tell you a little bit about how uh, we at the Center on Democracy Development and the Rule of Law got involved uh, in this project. We have been running a project called American Democracy in Comparative Perspective, uh, as I'm sure many Europeans have noted. Uh, the United States is rather self-absorbed when it comes to talking about its own democratic uh, institutions. For the most part, uh, Americans tend to believe that its form of constitutional democracy is perfect, and it's been largely perfect since 1789, and that there's not a whole lot that Americans can learn uh, from looking at democratic practices in other parts of the world. Uh, and yet, uh, it would seem that uh, there are indeed a lot of um, very problematic aspects of politics uh, in Washington and in other you know, state capitals in uh, the United States today, uh, and that uh, one of the things that we could do at our center was to bring this comparative uh, perspective to bear, that there might be some lessons, uh, believe it or not, that Americans could learn from democratic practices uh, in other parts of the world. And so this was the origins of our project. We've held four workshops to date. We did one on electoral systems and election administration. We did one on budgeting. Uh, we did one on lobbying and campaign finance. And our most recent one in May was on uh, transparency and uh, participation in modern uh, democracies. Each of these had a comparative uh, dimension to them. And so I'd like to speak a little bit uh, about how the United States fits in and, and the question of whether there is actually a global crisis of, uh, of democracy, uh, because I think that's one of the issues that the panels in our conference will have to, uh, will have to address. Uh, there are clearly similarities in the problems that democracies around the world have faced, and I think if you read the conference materials, uh, the introduction to the conference, it outlines many of them uh, quite clearly. So we begin with this question of disillusionment with existing uh, elites and institutions, which is very clear both in the uh, success in the polls of Donald Trump uh, in the Republican uh, uh, run-up to the Republican uh, primaries, but it's also uh, evident in the rise of various uh, populist parties, and actually having spent the last week in Scandinavia, I mean, it's interesting that 
you know, it's, it's funny in Europe because Scandinavia and Northern Europe is the least problematic in terms of good democratic practice and governance, and yet these are the places that have the strongest uh, populist, you know, anti-immigrant parties. It's an it's a odd conundrum why that doesn't happen in um, Southern Europe that obviously has been much more troubled in terms of uh, the economic crisis. So that's one, uh, there's one thing I think that immigration has been uh, a neuralgic issue in all of our countries. Uh, I think that money in politics and inequality, uh, which will be the subject of a panel tomorrow, uh, somehow, you know, uh, we believe that this is a background condition, a challenge uh, since, as Aristotle said, countries with uh, a large uh, group of people in the middle uh, rather than a lot of rich, uh, a lot of poor people and a few rich uh, is better ground for a successful democracy. And I think there's also a general phenomenon that manifests itself in a lot of places, in, and sometimes for good and sometimes for bad, that people are simply more empowered uh, these days. I think John you know, referred to that in these various color revolutions and uprisings uh, that are powered by the internet and by social media, that people can express their unhappiness uh, with existing political conditions, and they can mobilize uh, very um, rapidly. Uh, and I think, in general, uh, expectations that ordinary people have for what they get out of government has been rising uh, everywhere. Uh, and this actually has good aspects, but it also has troubling aspects. It, it means that uh, you do have uh, these mobilizations against bad authoritarian governments, as we've seen in Ukraine and uh, earlier in Georgia and, and, and other places. But it also means that existing democracies are also under uh, a tremendous amount of pressure, even when their performance has been uh, relatively good, that people's expectations for what government should give them has been rising faster than government's ability. The country that I think of in this regard is Chile. Chile has been by far economically and politically one of the most successful, stable uh, democracies in Latin America, and yet uh, they've been faced with this tide of protest uh, over uh, education, you know, the, the fact of, you know, access to education and uh, issues uh, like that. Uh, and so, in general, I think that we're entering a new phase where uh, demands for participation both in uh, undemocratic countries and in democratic ones have been rising, and uh, those uh, are common ones that all of us will face. Uh, on the other hand, I just want to raise some questions that I think we will get into in the course of the panels here about whether there is actually a general crisis of democracy going on. Uh, Larry Diamond has written, uh, and in fact we had a whole issue of the Journal of Democracy uh, devoted to this question of whether democracy is in decline. Larry has made a very strong case that there is a democratic recession. Uh, Freedom House scores and other measures, quantitative measures of democracy around the world have been in pretty steady decline uh, in for the last uh, nine years after having risen during the third wave of democracy for the previous uh, uh, 20 or so. Uh, and that's clearly something to worry about, but the, I guess the question really is whether this is actually a recession, you know, or let's say like a stock market correction in which the basic trend is upwards, but we're just going through a kind of rough patch here, uh, or whether this represents a more fundamental turning point in the legitimacy of democracy around the world. I tend to think that it is much more of the latter. Uh, and one question we have to raise is, okay, so both the United States and Europe have gone through major uh, financial crises and then economic recession. And countries don't do well. The legitimacy of the institutions of, of you know, democracies uh, don't do well when they go through uh, economic turmoil of this sort. But if you can get back to economic growth, and if the authoritarian rivals don't seem to be doing as well, uh, maybe people's opinions about this will change in, uh, you know, in a number of years. Uh, we are also going through a really interesting transition where China, for the first time, is really slowing down. So much of the growth in um, 
uh, around the world has been based on Chinese growth in Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, in the Middle East. And China actually now looks like it's in much more serious trouble. The China model, the economic part of the China model, uh, is in much more serious trouble. And quite frankly, their political model of authoritarianism mixed with some degree of, uh, of uh, private market uh, capitalism, uh, I think, uh, is in for a lot of stress uh, as it becomes harder and harder for the government uh, to guarantee jobs and uh, continuous growth. Uh, there's a very good side to this slowdown, which is the fall in global commodity prices. Uh, as you're well aware, uh, high oil prices have tended to benefit authoritarian governments, uh, most notably in Russia, but I think Iran and Venezuela and quite a number of other countries which have benefited from the fact that they don't have to tax their citizens. That was really the basic deal in, you know, in democracy. They're in big trouble now because uh, they cannot sustain the kinds of spending, uh, and that has direct impact on uh, Vladimir Putin and the appeal of uh, the Russian. I mean, I, I don't think there was a Russian model. I mean, they just lucked out sitting on all this energy. That's not much of a model, and I think the hollowness of that uh, approach to economic modernization uh, is being uh, is being demonstrated. Uh, I think that we need to really talk about whether there is a general crisis of the of democratic institutions or whether the crisis is actually much more specific to certain uh, countries. I tend to think uh, that it's uh, a little bit, there, there are common issues. I, I do tend to think, however, that um, there's probably not on a national level, on a nation state level, necessarily a crisis in democratic uh, institutions, but one thing we have to address is what's the unit of analysis that we're talking about? Are we talking, for example, you know, we're going to present a whole bunch of papers on the United States, but are we comparing the United States to individual democracies in Europe, or are we comparing it to the EU as a supranational uh, institution? And that matters a great deal because I think at a, at a member state level, a number of European democracies in the last 20 years have actually done pretty well. Uh, if you think about, uh, you know, much of Scandinavia, Holland, Germany, uh, even Britain in certain ways, uh, these governments have actually been able to tackle, for example, major labor market uh, reforms and have increased their competitiveness, made very tough decisions. If you expand the uh, universe of democracies to include a lot of the Commonwealth countries like Canada, Australia, New Zealand, uh, it becomes an actually even more uh, impressive uh, record. Uh, the problems are located in countries like uh, Italy, Greece, uh, Japan, where you have either a lack of social consensus or you have institutions that actually don't permit uh, getting to consensus that make them actually look a lot more like the United States. Where there are similarities is actually, I think, between the United States as a whole and the EU as a whole, and I don't need to tell you that there are some basic problems in the fundamental design uh, where actually American federalism has worked out better than European federalism because of the way that it allocated uh, powers. I've kind of felt that the designers of the European Union, and pr particularly the Maastricht system, got things fundamentally wrong where they allocated uh, strong powers in all the wrong places. And so the places where you actually needed a strong government, where we have it in the United States at a federal level, lie in the basic macroeconomic institutions, the European Central Bank and a common uh, fiscal system. And I think Europe is only going to solve the, the problem that was raised in the Euro crisis until it gets to something that looks like a transfer union, where there's a common fiscal policy with the agreement, as in the United States, that there will be transfers from you know, the periphery to the stronger uh, economies and that people will get over you know, the problems that they currently uh, have with this. And, I, and that's the area where I think there's very little uh, agreement. So in that respect, European institutions are way too weak. On the other hand, uh, again, completely opposite from the United States, uh, the structure of the EU has given extremely strong executive powers in areas where I think it's not that important, like, you know, what do you label your cheese or, or you know, how do you uh, export wine and, and, and this sort of thing, which is then able to drive people crazy, uh, you know, with the Brussels bureaucracy. 
uh, in this search for harmonization, uh, and yet, you know, the impact on real uh, economic uh, growth is not, uh, is not so clear. Uh, I would say that the fundamental problem with American democracy in a certain sense has actually been quite different from that of the United States. Our problem uh, has been gridlock uh, and the inability of the government to make uh, fundamental, important collective decisions. So as we speak, the Republican Party is, <laughs> I don't know, it's going through some kind of a meltdown. Uh, and you know, part of the issue is whether they want to shut the American government down in order to defund uh, this organization called Planned Parenthood. I mean, if you can believe this, uh, you know, that you would actually uh, uh, shut down the entire government over, you know, a, a tiny cultural uh, issue like that. But that, in fact, uh, is the uh, apparent intent of a certain part of the Republican Party. Now, in the United States, there's a clear majority preference for voting for budgets on time, raising the debt limit, doing a lot of other things. But the nature of our institutions privileges minorities. Uh, it's not a majoritarian system, and therefore, there's a lot of veto points in which a small, determined uh, minority of citizens can prevent you know, the majority from, uh, from uh, doing things. That's the problem in the budget. That's the problem in, uh, you know, for example, I'll give you another uh, case of this with uh, dealing with immigration. So comprehensive immigration reform has been on the agenda for you know, quite a while. This has been attempted by uh, multiple administrations. Uh, the most recent one was under George W. Bush. If you look at poll data, there's actually uh, majority support in the country for uh, something like this, a way to legalize existing immigrants. Because I think fundamentally, the United States has been pretty welcoming uh, to immigrants, and people understand that immigration has done the country uh, a lot of good. There is, of course, a very vocal minority uh, represented by people like Donald Trump, but, you know, he, first of all, you know, and I think there's a misunderstanding about what his poll numbers mean. So the Republicans at most don't constitute more than about 40 percent at most of the total electorate. So Donald Trump gets maybe 20 percent of a Republican uh, poll, you know, prior to a primary, which means he's getting 20 percent of 40 percent. So the actual number of Americans who agree with him, despite all the media attention, is minuscule. Right? And so there actually has been support for comprehensive immigration reform, but the American system does not allow the majority to coalesce around you know, what I would regard as a sensible uh, position and allows you know, minorities to uh, continue to block things that majorities want to do. Uh, this is why we don't get gun control. You know, a couple of years ago, we wanted to pass uh, a very mild uh, gun control measure that would simply force people to register their guns. It had something like 90% support from the American people in a whole variety of polls, but you've got this very powerful organ uh, lobby, the National Rifle Association, that succeeded in blocking it. And so down the line, there's a lot of cases where actually the problem in the United States, in my view, is that we have too many checks and balances that then prevent us from getting to uh, any kind of collective action. Uh, I would say that the European problem is a bit of, of the opposite, that both at the EU level and at the level of individual uh, parliamentary democracies uh, in this region, uh, the structure of the, the fundamental structure of the institutions is biased the opposite direction, uh, where you have very strong executive powers by which elites in uh, Europe have been able to guide, you know, the course of European democracy and relatively little uh, uh, legislative input. So the, this starts obviously at the EU level where, uh, you know, the reason that people are always voting for these protest parties in the EU parliament is that everybody knows that the parliament doesn't do anything important and so therefore it's relatively safe, you know, to vote for uh, one of these extremist parties, uh, and a lot of the actual, you know, work in Brussels is actually done in the Commission or through the Council uh, in a way that is quite distant, you know, and, and I think that's the fundamental democratic deficit, that mm -hmm. Europeans don't believe that they can actually participate to the same degree uh, in uh, those things that, you know, those wine and cheese labels that, that you know, bother them, um, and there's not a sufficient degree of uh, accountability, whereas in the United States, you know, Congress is wide open to uh, these kinds of um, 
uh, popular inputs. I think at a member state level, you have a similar kind of biasing towards the executive and away from legislatures. This is why European, I mean, I was in Norway <laughs> uh, yesterday. They, the government just presented its budget. Uh, you know, the budget will be voted on and accepted within a week uh, compared to the, you know, six month or nine month process that unfolds uh, in uh, the United States. And I think a lot of the alienation in Europe is not uh, that minorities are blocking majorities as in the United States, but the fact that, uh, you know, the, the majority institutions have been in control of things and have not given adequate voice to uh, minority positions. And that's what's, you know, fueling, I think, a lot of the uh, popular resistance against the EU, this belief that elites are out of touch uh, and so forth. And by the way, I should note that in terms of elites being out of touch, uh, we would have to concede on both sides of the Atlantic that they have been out of touch and that if they had done their job better, uh, in a sense, we wouldn't have the kind of resistance that we have. And I'm speaking in terms of you know, macroeconomic policy. We both went through really major economic crises that hurt ordinary people, and they were based on mistaken policies you know, that were strongly backed by elites in uh, both regions. And so it's not as if you know, uh, everybody is completely, uh, you know, that the existing political structure is completely uh, blameless uh, in all of this. Finally, I, I guess I would just say that populism looks superficially similar in both countries, but it really is actually, when you look at it more closely, uh, quite different. I mean, the American form of populism is so bizarre that it's just hard to <laughs> explain to people what it's about, that you get all these working class, um, you know, white men in the United States who have been hurt by deindustrialization, that don't have jobs, that are seeing their incomes eroded, and then they vote for Republican politicians who pursue the policies that are actually undermining their economic position. And, you know, they're voting in that manner because uh, they actually care about guns and, uh, you know, abortion and other kinds of uh, cultural issues much more than uh, they care about uh, their uh, actual socioeconomic, I mean, these people, you know, would have voted, they would have voted for a, a social democratic party or a socialist party in Europe but they vote for a conservative party in the United States, and that's just a feature of, uh, of American exceptionalism. Possibilities for change, uh, this is an interesting thing. I, as I was putting together these notes in my hotel room this morning, I realized I didn't know uh, what I should say about this because one of the problems that we've confronted, and by the way, we're going to publish the results of our project in a special interest of the American Interest magazine that will be out imminently. Uh, and one of the things that Bruce Kane and I in our introduction said is that the possibilities for change in the United States are extremely limited. We've got a constitutional system that is worshipped as if it were a holy book. Uh, it's almost impossible uh, to change that constitution and therefore anything that we could suggest institutionally to fix things uh, is actually a very, very uh, narrow uh, range of policy uh, initiatives. The EU constitution on the EU level uh, is actually uh, similarly difficult. I mean, it's going to be really hard to go back at that level and, you know, undo parts of Maastricht or anything else. Uh, on a member state level, it does strike me that it's a little bit easier. The stuff that Renzi has proposed in Italy is actually, despite the fragmentation of the Italian system, is actually much more, you know, uh, um, dramatic than anything that uh, is imaginable in the United States. So that's an issue I, you know, I really don't have an opinion uh, uh, about. So all of this, um, I guess, leads me to the final conclusion that the topic of this conference is really important because I think that unless both Europe and the United States get their act together, the fate of democracy in other parts of the world is simply not going to be secure. We can hope uh, in certain ways that Russia and China also melt down in, you know, uh, doing what they're doing and they don't look as attractive in the coming years. But quite frankly, uh, one of the things that I think has struck me uh, in the 25 years since, uh, you know, I started writing on this subject is one of the most important attractors for democracy uh, in this period is the fact that 
uh, the United States and Europe looked pretty good. Uh, they looked like they were both successful, stable, uh, economically prosperous, and the like. And I'm really quite struck talking to a lot of people who are sympathetic to the United States uh, uh, in recent years that almost nobody would say, yeah, we want to look like Washington. You know, we want to have a polarized gridlock government that's ready to shut down, you know, the full faith and credit of the United States for these really ridiculous uh, causes uh, and so forth. And so I think uh, that was really certainly the motivation of uh, me and my colleagues in pursuing our project, that we needed to get our act together in the United States. I think Europe needs to get its act together. And uh, I really look forward to, you know, the two days here to see what, you know, what if any common uh, uh, ideas, or even if they're not common, what ideas, uh, uh, you know, can feed into your uh, final conference. So thank you. Thank you very much. So I think we have about 10 minutes for um, some questions, comments. Um, anyone from the audience, this is intended to be a very interactive conference, so we're going to try to leave time throughout for this. So please, anyone feel free to raise your hand, make a comment, ask a question. Yes. And if you could just uh, identify yourself so that Francis Fuki will know who you are. Thank you. Andre Nosko, the Think Tank Fund. I would like to follow up on the distinction that you're trying to make between the populism in, in US and in Europe. And uh, when we look at actually the populism here, it's not that straightforward that they would actually be voting for far right. Uh, and these voters would be the voters that would traditionally be voting on the right. What we also see is that the, the far right has been able to attract also the traditional voters of social democratic parties. Right. So you have a mix of it's actually the, the, the classical mixture of, on the one hand, you are serving people welfare, but on the other hand, when, when you run out of money or you cannot provide them with, with money, uh, you actually serve them nationalism. No, that's right. So, um, yeah, like the National Front in France, a lot of their voters actually used to vote communist, and now they're voting uh, for uh, Marine Le Pen. <laughs> That's true. Uh, I think the attitudes, however, towards the state are just really different in, uh, in the two regions. So uh, I think in Europe, those uh, threatened uh, kind of working class voters are worried that uh, the influx of immigrants is going to compete with them for their welfare state <laughs> benefits as well as their jobs. Whereas in the United States, uh, I think that, you know, the concern, I mean, there's this deep distrust of the state, and so a lot of those voters actually want to abolish, uh, you know, major parts of the American welfare state. And the competition really is more in the labor market than it is, you know, over the uh, over the role of government. But yeah, you're right that in both places there is this kind of, uh, uh, you know, shifting of allegiances from the left to the right that's taken place in the last generation. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, let, let me just ask one while, well, go ahead. We, we don't want to lose anybody in the audience. I have questions of my own, yeah. but please. Thank you. Um, you mentioned Would that. Would you tell us who you are? So, so yeah. first of all, I'm uh, Strahinja. I'm a student from Serbia. I'm here at Graduate Studies of Political Science, one year program. So, for Mr. Fukuyama, one question. Uh, when you talked about the US, you mentioned the government has a lot of veto points. Well, isn't that the point of the whole government, since uh, they're yeah. trying to uh, reduce uh, any chance of uh, anybody getting too much power? So in case of uh, slowdown of a government, that actually means that the system is uh, fulfilling its purpose. So would yeah, you no, I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad you raised that point, because I want to make something absolutely clear. Uh, the particular institutional design of a system depends very, very much on the specific context of a country. So the big threat in Hungary and other uh, uh, countries in Europe is exactly, as you suggest, the erosion of veto points, checks, and balances. Uh, and the, so I don't, I by no means want to have anyone interpret what I say about the United States as you know, having too many of these veto points as therefore a broad uh, endorsement of 
reduction of veto points. You, you know, Hungary needs to move in exactly the opposite direction. You need uh, more checks on uh, executive uh, authority. Although, you know, in a certain sense, there is a kind of relationship between them because if you get gridlock government for a long time, that oftentimes builds political support for moving to the other extreme of having, you know, delegation to a strong executive. And so what you really want is something, uh, you know, something in between. Um, I would say that beyond the, the formal institutional design uh, of the constitutional system and, and the formal veto points, there's also a really important element of um, political culture that makes a big difference. So I wrote this little blog post about, I don't know, when, when Orban's government came back into power, I wrote this blog post where I pointed out that if you looked at the new Hungarian uh, constitution, it actually did not give formal powers to the government uh, in a greater way than the British Westminster system. Right, the Westminster system, the classic Westminster system has been called a democratic dictatorship because apart from periodic parliamentary elections, there's almost no veto points, right? Uh, and I said, you know, the problem in Hungary is not the formal checks and balances, it's the political culture because historically in England and then in Britain, the fact that you've got this really powerful concentrated uh, power in the prime minister's office in the in the cabinet has not meant that the majority uses its power to run roughshod over minorities. There's respect for opposition. There's a belief that you have to have a you know a kind of fair playing field for for opponents. And none of that is written into the British. I mean, the British don't even have a written constitution. That's all a matter of the informal norms that uh, that make that system work and exactly the same British system uh, in the hands of uh, a different, uh, you know, political elite could be, you know, could be disastrous. And so I think that's, that's important to keep in mind that when you talk about veto points and institutional rules and so forth, the formal rules, yes, they, they make a difference, but the same formal rules can be used in very, very different ways. And I think, you know, the problem here in Hungary has been, <laughs> you know, the elite that's been, you know, trying to take advantage of them and, and, and doing things to shut down, you know, opposition voices and ram through legislation and uh, that sort of thing. Yes. Oh. Okay, thank you very okay, much. Okay, here and then and the, you next. If Keep them fairly short, please, because we've got about five minutes. Okay. Yes, I am from, I'm a student from CU. I am from the Legal Studies Department. I want you uh, to ask you, Professor, uh, very respectfully about the new claims of uh, participation of the society. I'm from Latin America, and we are seeing lots of claims about uh, social movements. Yeah. They are making uh, even their own constitutions, and there, there is a new claim for social rights, and uh, uh, the um, Communitary democracy is also recognized in our constitution. So, uh, how does it influence to the new uh, uh, demands of democracy now? Well, you know, my uh, mentor Samuel Huntington had this basic paradigm in in his book *Political Order and Changing Societies*, in which he said that uh, political decay happens when uh, political institutions do not develop adequately to meet new demands for social participation by new, newly mobilized groups. And the reason in the 20th century that by the end of the 20th century European democracy worked is that in countries like, you know, France and, and Britain, you had, you know, kind of rising industrial working class that was incorporated into the system via trade unions and then by social democratic parties were represented and then could get their agendas uh, enacted. Uh, and now what you're seeing in Latin America and other parts of the world is a very similar process where there's a lot of formerly excluded groups. I mean, in Latin America, a lot of them are indigenous, you know, uh, groups that were not given access to the political system. And the stability of all of those places will actually depend on whether the political system can, in fact, open up and give them, uh, you know, an ability to formally participate. Uh, so that's, in principle, yes, that's a really important thing. The question in, you know, let's say Bolivia or Ecuador is whether 
that participation <laughs> is actually kind of a mask for, you know, kind of the current government's sort of remaining in power, uh, you know, indefinitely and, and manipulating, you know, their constitutions in order to, uh, you know, keep themselves and their party going for a long time rather than actually genuinely opening the system up, you know, to, you know, to popular participation. So we have a question right here, please. Hi, I'm Olympia. I'm first year PhD student here in comparative politics. I wanted to ask about you, your opinion. Uh, just for the, could you just tell us where you're from? I'm from Macedonia. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I would like to ask about your understanding of how people actually understand democracy. Do you think this is also changing? What is at the centerpiece of their understanding? Because they are, if you see, like if we see the polls, they are for democracy, but then they bring governments that they know they will strike into their freedom or, I don't know, equality. So do you think also this per perception is changing? What is the demand side, actually? Maybe it's not really representation. <coughs> well, uh, you know, I think actually Viktor Orban was quite accurate when he said he wants a liberal democracy. <laughs> so um, democracy is actually a heterogeneous uh, set of components, one of which is electoral accountability and sort of majoritarian government. The other part of it is a liberal rule of law that protects minority rights, individual rights, and the like. Uh, I would say there's a third component too, which is a capable state that can actually deliver you know, services and, and, and goods uh, to, to people. Uh, and they don't necessarily all go together. And so Orban says, yes, I've got a majority in the parliament, and therefore we ought to be able to do whatever we want, including violate the rights of minorities. And so that's basically taking only one of these components of democracy and privileging it over a rule of law that would protect the rights of minorities. And so he has a very different vision and he is properly labeling that as illiberal uh, democracy. Uh, so, you know, to the extent that he and his followers actually believe that, they don't believe in the same thing that I believe in when I, you know, say that I'm in favor of a liberal democracy. Uh, thank you. I think we uh, have to end here because we want to stay on schedule. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Frank, and uh, we'll now move to the next panel.